um, you grew up without your father. So can you catch people up on just your growing up years? And then I want to talk a little bit about what a great dad you were and how in the world did you ever figure that out? So you grew, you were born in Dry Fort, Virginia. Dry Fort, Virginia. My father died when I was nine months of age. So my mother had to go to work. And so then I got shifted around from one person to the other, keeping me while she worked. And that went on for a number of years. And then, of course, starting the school, I was uh, very shy. And um, I think, how did I ever get through grammar school? Yeah, because in, in some cases, I remember these stories as a, as a kid. Um, you know, when I thought I had it hard, you would talk about getting yourself up in the morning, fixing your own breakfast, because your mom had already gone to work at the mill. Well, it was difficult, but, uh, you know, my mom taught me how to fry an egg or scramble an egg and toast. And uh, then, of course, after a while, I learned that well enough so I could just fix me maybe some other things. But I, she taught me to be able yeah. to do whatever I need to do and to trust God that he would help me. And that's the thing that I kept hearing her, just trust the Lord. Just do what you know is right and trust the Lord. So she drilled that into my head and that I could do whatever I need to do if I would trust him. To the theme this morning, because what we're going to do is we're not going to talk about uh, how to discipline children or how to communicate well with your mate. It's not going to be a, a marriage and family seminar kind of thing where you pay $50 and go for three Saturday mornings in a row. Uh, it, it's, it's church, and it's a, a message from Scripture. And so we're going to be looking at the link between our faith and the fact that we have relationships, relationships uh, within the church, within our biological families, uh, within, within our nation. Uh, we are citizens of a nation. And so uh, we're, we're going to be we're going to be examining what it is to be a Christian in those relationships. Just a couple of things, first of all, though, uh, that I was supposed to mention when I was doing the prayer, but I got so involved with all the people. One is that the new Bible reading cards for January are out, and so um, help yourself. And um, the uh, the theme is new and fresh. New and fresh. Thought that that would be a good theme for, uh, for this year. And then also, I am going to wait a week on my Bible study. So those of you who are in Monday evening, Wednesday evening, and Wednesday morning Bible studies, I'm going to wait a week. I'm still going to take this week. I don't want to push it. <clears throat> so hopefully next week, we'll begin my Bible studies. Now, the Wednesday morning women's Bible study does meet. Uh, and that's in the bulletin. You can check it out. But my Bible studies will um, will will wait a week. Um, probably smart. So, okay. And uh, I noticed a couple of you coming in while we were singing that last song. I know the driving is a little bit difficult this morning, but I also expressed a lot of thanks. The light of wanted me to make sure too that I said thank you to everybody. And wow, we just <laughs> and uh, the food. We got food, folks. Wow, we got food. Lots of food. So I'm going to gain weight. Great cashews, popcorn with chocolate on. Oh. Okay. Nuts and raisins. Wow, all kinds of good stuff. Somebody brought over two uh, lasagna dinners from Arnie's. <sighs> good stuff. Great. <laughs> there are benefits. <laughs> I mentioned a moment ago that we're not in this series simply going to have lectures on how to be good parents. For one thing, most of the people that are in the first service have moved beyond that. Now, we're still parents, a lot of us. But our children have grown, they're out on their own, they have their own children. In fact, some of us are, some of you, are, are great-grandparents. Uh, we're not going to be focusing in on how to communicate well with your mate and instructions on that, because, again, a lot of us in this room have been doing that for many years, and it's been successful. 
And once again, I want to make sure that we, we maintain the fact that this is a message in the church on the Word of God. So when I say that we're going to have a series on marriage and family, those of you who uh, feel very secure in your family, I don't want you to sit there and go, oh no, I'm going to have to hear about how I have to listen better or, um, or, or how we have to do this or that with uh, disciplining the children. Now, some of that is going to come in, of course, but that's not going to be the focus. The focus will be, what does it mean as a Christian to be part of, of a unit, a family, a nation, a church? What does that mean? And as, as I was reading over the past couple of weeks in anticipation of this morning, I came across a word that... Um, that I have always enjoyed thinking about. It's a word that very possibly a lot of you haven't come across. It's a word that, um, that you're going to find if you read a lot of the ancient thinkers. If you go way back to the ancient church, to ancient philosophy, it's a, it's a word that, that a lot of the ancient thinkers used to toss around a lot. And it is the word pietas. Pietas, P-I-E-T-A-S, Pietas. Now, some of you might pick up on that and, and go, now, wait a minute, isn't that the name of some sculptures of Mary and Jesus? And the answer is, yes, it is. But that's not really what the word is all about. It's an old Latin word, and the philosophers like Plato and Aristotle used to think about and talk about that word a lot as did the, the, the early Christian thinkers. Because pietas is an ancient Latin word that means piety. What it is to be pious. And one of the advantages of using the word pietas is that the word pious has gotten some kind of unfortunate baggage in our day and age. Pious sometimes has come to mean uh, a person who is um, maybe a little over-spiritual. They're always quoting Bible verses. They're a little bit difficult to be with. They're always telling you how great their faith is. They, they, they refuse to, to do things like watch television or eat fancy foods because they have to be spiritual. Uh, one, one Roman Catholic author that I was reading on this topic of pietas, he said, he said that, that that way of using the word pious, that, that incorrect way of using the word pious, he says, it reminds me of elderly ladies kneeling at the altar, shaking while they grasp, while they grasp their rosary beads. Well, we don't have that problem here. But I think you get the idea. You know what I mean when I say that that's not what pious really means. See, see pietas, that old Latin word, that, that challenged those thinkers to think about piety. What, what really is piety? What does it mean to be pious? See, if, if, if I am to be pious, does that mean that I become sort of strange and unworldly and irrelevant that I kneel at the altar shaking while I grasp my rosary beads? And the answer is no, that's not pietas. Pietas is something really deep, and profound, and interesting, and exciting. John Calvin, I believe, gives us one of the best definitions when he talks about pietas. And all those guys, they like to write in Latin and think in Latin and all of that. So, so they, they use that word pietas. But, but John Calvin says, and here it is, John Calvin says pietas is first and, and foremost reverence for and love of God. That's where you begin with pietas. True piety is reverence for God. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name 
in all of the earth. And love for God. Love for God. That's where you begin. And then Calvin goes on to say, and, and, and that reverence for God and that love for God comes from a knowledge, a very intimate soul felt knowledge of all of God's benefits. You look around and you see all of the good things that, that have come your way. The food, the clothes, the love, the family and friends, the healing. And you go, Lord, it's a gift from you. <sighs> Reverence for and love for God because you recognize you have a knowledge of the fact that everything in life has come from him and you are so thankful. You believe that God is the author, he is the author of every single gift that we have. He is the author of, of every part of life. He is the author with a capital A. Everything, Lord, has come from you, and I am thankful. And therefore, I have this reverence for you, this love for you. Nothing in life, not, there is nothing in life that is independent of God's loving hand and his gift. Some of you are familiar, perhaps, with that famous quote of Abraham Kuyper, uh, that square inch quote, that there is no square inch in the entire universe over which Christ does not declare mine. Or in other words, God owns every square inch of every part of life. And therefore, therefore, all of our actions, all of our behaviors, and this is true pietas, all of our actions and all of our behaviors are done with reference to the fact that we have this, this reverence for God, this love for God, and recognize that everything has come from him. We have this intimacy with God. One of the ancient Latin writers who wrote about Pietas, his name is Lactantius. I remember when I was going to school and taking Latin, I had to read Lactantius. Oh, uh, that was an adventure. But Lactantius said, he said, without Pietas, we lose our humanity. In other words, if you want to be really human, if you want to understand what it really means to be a man, to be a woman, to be a husband, to be a wife, to be a father, to be a mother, to be a grandfather, to be a grandmother, if you really want to understand that, you have to have pietas. You have to understand that all of these things, all of these people, all of these gifts have come from the hand of God. That reverence. It, it, is, it is a virtue that God has given. You don't cook pietas up on your own. You don't just sit around one day and say, oh, I have this great reverence for God, this great love for God, and I recognize that all things have come from his hand. It's a, it's a virtue that has been given to us by God. It's a gift that has come from God but it is a gift that we need to recognize and we need to cultivate and we need to come to understand more and more. And that then leads us into this whole thing of family and marriage and home because, because it isn't enough to just read a book about marriage or learn about communication or, or listen to a talk on how to be a good mom or a good dad. Now, those things are important. And they can be very good. But, but it has to begin with pietas. It has to begin by saying, Lord, this wife, this husband, it's your gift. Th this grandchild, this son, this daughter, it's a gift. Lord, I praise you. I, I, I praise you. And, and not only that, but the fact that I'm a citizen in the country, that's a gift from God. That, that I have friends, that's a gift from God. He is the author of friendship. He is the author of citizenship. The relationships that I have at work, 
God is the author of my work and of the relationships that I have at work. And that's the way that God talks in the Bible. We're going to look at that, that classic passage on marriage. It comes out of Ephesians chapter 5. And that classic passage on parenting that comes out of Ephesians 6. Now, as we read this, notice that Paul doesn't just, the Apostle Paul writes this, and he doesn't just say, hey, everybody, here's how to be a good husband. Uh, bring home flowers once in a while. Uh, here's how to be a good wife. Uh, if he's had surgery, make sure you make some special food for him. I mean, those things are good and they're right. But what Paul does is he links, he links marriage and parenting to our relationship with God. This passage is an excellent passage on what pietas, true piety, is all about. Let's read it. Starting with Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. Now notice, don't just love your wife, but as Christ loves the church and gave himself up. See, see, true pietas is, I learn how to love a spouse by learning the love of Jesus. Next verse. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blood. You see, the goal, the goal is that in my relationships, I recognize that they are rooted in the love of God. He is the author of them. And the goal is that along with God's help, I will help the people that I live with and that I love to become all that God has created them to be. To help them become all that God has created them to be. He who loves his wife loves himself. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ. See, here it is again. You learn about caring for yourself and for those around you by learning about the love of Christ for his church. For we are all members of his body. For this is the reason a man leaves his father and mother and is united with his wife. This is out of Genesis chapter 2, and they become one flesh. This is a profound mystery. This is a mystery how the two become one, but I am talking about Christ. See, here again, if you really want to understand the unity that you have with your spouse, you have to understand it in relationship to the unity of Jesus with the church. This is true pietas. Okay. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And the wife must respect and love, of course, her husband. And then moving on to chapter 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. For this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy. See, true pietas is that the obedience, the disciplining, the care of children, and their obedience, that is the way that God has created things so that people can enjoy long life. They can be happy. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. Now, really, what Paul is saying is what we find in the summary of the law of God, the famous summary of the law of God, which says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. So now notice, loving the neighbor who is anyone with whom I live, anyone with whom I come into contact, a citizen, a fellow worker, uh, a spouse, a family member, that I am to love them and I am to love myself and that is rooted in 
the love of God. And that is true pietas. That's true piety. So a truly pious person then is the one not quivering and shaking uh, at the altar, clutching the rosaries, uh, or quoting all kinds of Bible passages, or abstaining from television. But a truly pious person is the person who contemplates the goodness of God in his or her life and says, you know what? This wife, this husband, this child, this grandchild, this fellow worker, my neighbors, they're gifts from God. And God has given them to me so that I can help them to become all that God has created them to be. And then I go out and I do it. I, then, then I actually talk and I behave and I act in such a way that, that, that I recognize that God is the author, the creator, the designer of all of those people and all of those relationships that I have with those people. Now also, what God has given us is ways that we can further develop those relationships in ways that those relationships can be deepened and made more beautiful and more precious. One of those is traditions. Traditions, customs. Like, um, like the wedding ceremony itself. Back in the 1970s, there were uh, couples that were beginning to say, we don't need that piece of paper called a marriage license. We don't need to have the white dress and the tuxedo. Uh, we don't have to go into a church and have a minister talk and, and so on. Uh, we can just go out under the stars and we can pledge love to each other and we can just, yeah, you know. No, no, no. There is something that is important about ceremony. See, God has given ceremony as one of the instruments by which I can develop that sense of this relationship is precious. This relationship is unique. In, um, in one of the, the books that I've been reading through, it's called The Mystery of Marriage. It's written by a man named Mike Mason. He talks about the vows, and he says, um, he says, so while love must certainly be present in a marriage, love must be there if that marriage must continue to be successful. But practically speaking, it is the vows which really hold the marriage together that undergirds the love. Marriages which consistently look back to their vows now, look back to your vows. What is a vow? It is a pledge to God and before God about commitment, about faithfulness, about love. See, that, that vow then is a ceremony that reflects true pietas, true piety. So marriages which consistently look back to the vows, to those wild promises before God, and he says wild promises because, you know, you say, in sickness or in health. And sometimes I've stood before these 21-year-olds, in sickness or in health. And I think, yeah, wait 50 years. And you got to sit next to them and hold their hand in an institution. You really know what you're saying? Yeah, do you really know? For richer or for poorer, <laughs> you really know he comes home if he's the traditional breadwinner and he says, I just lost my job. You really know what you're saying. See, those wild promises, but you say them before God and you root that relationship then in the promise before God. And so, and so it goes back to the marriages which consistently look back to their vows, to those wild promises made before God, and which trust him to make sense out of them and find continual source of strength and renewal in those vows. 
I, um, I have an office at home. <clears throat> it is also my man cave. And, uh, and, and the wall in front of me, I, I have a desk, I have a seat, and the wall in front of me has different things hanging on it. And one of them is a picture of Elida in her wedding dress. Yeah. Every day, because I'm in that office every day, literally, every day, there she is. Vows, institutions, or, or other institutions and customs and traditions. Did you hear yourself this past December? Maybe you called up a relative, or you said to your husband or to your wife or to your son or your daughter, what are we going to do about Christmas? What, are we, what do you mean, what are we going to do about Christmas? Well, Christmas, you know, birth of Jesus. And what are we going to do about, what do you mean, what are we going to do about Christmas? Now, what you meant was, we always get together. That's what we do. But now we've got distancing and masks and COVID and everything. And, and, and some people are a whole lot more nervous about that than others. And so a lot of people did not get together. Or, or um, I, I heard Elida telephone one of our daughters because one of our grandchildren has a birthday in December. What are you going to do about so-and-so's birthday? Now, what are you really saying there? What you're saying is we have established traditions. We have established customs. And they are important. They are meaningful. They help us to develop the relationships. They help us to develop who we are, who we are as a family, who we are as, as friends with one another within that family. And so customs and traditions become very important. Vacations, how you do them. Some family, every summer, they're off in their camper. Other families don't like campers. They put a swimming pool in the backyard or whatever. But it's, it's ways that the family creates as the years go by, to deepen and make more profound the relationship that was initially established when they first fell in love, or when they first had that, that baby boy, or that baby girl, or that grandchild. Recognizing that this is a gift from God, and I've got to do stuff that helps me to celebrate that that helps me to express that. And how horrible it is when that is violated. Some of my most uh, painful moments, painful moments have been moments in which um, somebody sits in my office and they say, um, well, for example, one man in our church, he said, my dad was an elder in the church and everybody thought he walked on water wore his suit, he was profoundly pious in that old traditional sense, you know, very spiritual, until we got home and the door was shut and the shades were pulled, and then he would beat my mother and he would swear at the children and sometimes beat the children. And you can imagine how that man has struggled to be a husband, to be a father, to be a Christian. Terrible. It's terrible when, when people take what God has created and they begin to abuse and violate. See, that, that, that marriage relationship has something about it which goes beyond the fact that two people have made vows. Some of you will remember the name Rolf Veenstra. He was a, a Christian reform minister for many years, and he wrote a book. It's an old classic called Christian Marriage. And uh, Rolf Feenstra made a, an interesting point in his book on marriage. He says, and I'm going to read it first, and then I'll tell you what I think he means. He says, through the miracle of marriage, two separate individuals become basically one. That's what that passage said that we read earlier out of Genesis chapter 2. The two become one flesh. <clears throat> He said, through the miracle of marriage, the two separate individuals become basically one. 
And those two, in turn, bring into being a third individual who is one with them. Flesh of their flesh, and yet a separate person. And herein is a faint but real reflection of him who was at once three, and yet one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, he's not talking here about having a child, even though that could be an example of the Trinity. What he's talking about is the fact that when those two come together and they have love, that there is something beyond the two of them which is a beautiful reality. It's kind of like when people talk about a crowd. A crowd is something more than just a collection of individuals. A crowd has a certain spirit, a, 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 certain, a, a certain character about it. Uh, some people have asked me, is it easier to preach to a small group or to a large group? Well, it has different advantages and disadvantages. But there's something about a large group which is very exciting because it has sort of a, uh, in the German, a heist, a spirit, a character about it that is more than just the fact that there's a collection of individuals. And so also a marriage. There is something that is above and beyond the two in their relationship which becomes a beautiful reality. And so people will talk about, about a couple that, that has a good marriage, and they'll say, you know, they have a beautiful relationship. Now, what do they mean by that? What they mean is that there is something that emanates from the relationship, which is more than just the fact that two people live under the same roof. And, and, and so it's like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There's, there's a threeness with the marriage couple, the husband, the wife, and then also that beautiful spirit that emanates from their love. And, and the same is true in a, in a family. The family gets together again for Christmas, or they get together for the birthday celebration. And there is something more than just the fact that you have 10 or 12 people in your living room. There's a spirit there. There's a beauty there. And that's a gift from God. That's his creation. And true pietas sits back and says, yeah. Yeah, there's something beautiful here. Something good. And I need to do everything I can to cultivate that, to develop it, and make it more beautiful. Now, the same is true in our, our nation. This past year, we've seen, in, instead of people celebrating their nation, Patriotism, love of country, there have been mobs, there have been slanderous things, there have been hate. It's horrible. See, <clears throat> it's like in a marriage. In a marriage, you can have arguments and complaints about one another, um, disagreements, sure, but you work through it. And you grow from it. The same in a nation. But look at what has happened this past year within our nation. Instead of saying, you know, we have had some bad characters in our, in our land, some people that have done some bad things, and we ought to talk about that, and we ought to learn from it. But instead, what we have done is we have torn down statues. We have eliminated, we have ripped pages out of history books because we don't want to talk about bad people. A nation is more than just agreeing with what some mob wants. A nation is a people that are united in that same kind of spirit, that heist, that says we are one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. And if we've got some ills, if we've got some warts, if we've got some problems, we'll work on it, we'll recognize it, we'll talk about it, we'll repent of it. But God, thank you for our land. Thank you for our nation. God bless America. See, that's pietas. Pietas doesn't mean out of touch with reality, shaking at the altar, quoting Bible verses. Pietas means that I look at family, I look at friends, I look at children and grandchildren, and I say, all of this, this nation, this workplace, this neighborhood, it's a gift from God. 
And what can I do to strengthen it, deepen it, through institutions, traditions, the kind of relationships that help people to grow, just like we read in Ephesians chapter 5. It's kind of like having the shadow of God hover over everything that I am and everything that I do. And then it spills out. Remember, some of you from time to time will remind me of that story that I've told about the time that I had pots of dirt with seeds planted in them, and I had them, I had them sitting alongside the edge of our swimming pool in our backyard. And my one grandson came walking along and got a little bit too close to one, and his foot hit it, hit one of those pots, and it spilled over the edge and fell into my nice, clean, pure, perfect water. And I thought to myself, what I say to him in the next 30 seconds could impact the rest of our lives. You stupid jerk. Watch where you're going. Clumsy feet, you idiot. No, no, no. It's okay. Oh, it's all right. Here, come on. Let's scoop out the dirt together. We'll have fun doing it because I love you. Granddaughter called on the phone the other night, our 10-year-old granddaughter. She just needed a piece of information, needed to know a birth date, one of our, one of our grandkids' birth date. Said, she called up said, can you tell me so-and-so's birth date? And I checked with the person who keeps track of birth dates. <laughs> and then I said, that's the birth date. And I said, okay, bye, and I hung up the phone. I, I got to lying in bed later that night, and I thought, why did I hang up so quick, so quickly? Here's my 10-year-old granddaughter, and I haven't seen a lot of her because of COVID. And I could have asked her about school, about what she got for Christmas. And so the next morning, I called her. I called her on the phone. She calls me Appa, and I said, this is your Appa. I said, I was kind of sleepy last night when you called, but I just want to know about what's going on. How's school? Well, I don't have school. I'm on vacation. Yeah, but you know, and so we talked. We talked. Henry Barron, that English professor that I've mentioned from time to time, he, um, he writes, we strive to grow strong the bonds between parent and child. We care when they hurt, and we celebrate when they achieve. We listen to their stories, and we lead them in the way that they should go. And then one day we discover that they are grown up, eager to go out on their own, and then we pray for grace to let them go. Notice we pray for grace to let them go. That's pietas. And when they go, we let them know our prayers. We'll always follow them. Thank you, Father. God the Father. Thank you, Father for teaching us about being good parents. We love our children. Notice, for teaching us, Father, that's pietas. We love our children, and we care about them very much, and we want to enjoy them. To show them our care, the care that we have for them, we want to be good examples, to encourage them to do the right and save them from doing the wrong. Help us to do and to be Lord, help us to do and to be. That's pietas. See, it come, he is the author. He is the giver. I don't just go to the seminar, but I go to the source. First of all, that's pietas. That's piety. Help us to do and to be what our children need most. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments are to be upon your hearts and impress them upon your children and your grandchildren.
Talk about them when you sit at home. Talk about them when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And so I begin the series, not with instructions on how to be a good dad or a good mom or a good husband or a good wife, but begin this series by saying, always go back to the source, the author, with that reverence, that love. And then say, okay, Lord, now, teach me, show me in my relationships how to be what you have created me to be and to help them to be what you have created them to be, to your glory, to your praise.